and welcome to Fade Out HIV. I'm your moderator, Tabitha Washington with DKB Med. Thank you for joining us. We're excited to bring you this very important webinar today. It's widely known that HIV disproportionately impacts the Black and Latinx community. We also know that the barbershop is a community hub in many Black and Latinx communities. It's a safe space to discuss everything from politics to sports to current events. We're pleased to announce that we're working with Black and Latinx barbershops throughout the country to educate their clients on the importance of knowing their HIV status to prevent the spread of HIV. If you're watching us from the Los Angeles area, we hope you'll join our network of local healthcare providers. You'll be part of a select group that barbers can feel comfortable referring their clients to. Stay tuned throughout this presentation on ways you can become part of the movement to fade out HIV. We are pleased to welcome our expert faculty, Dr. William King. Dr. King is a primary care physician and certified HIV specialist in the Los Angeles area. He is an associate professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at Charles R. Drew University. Dr. King is also a member of the Los Angeles County Commission on HIV, which serves as the local planning council for the delivery of HIV and AIDS services. He has received numerous awards for leadership, volunteerism, and community support, and has also worked nationally and internationally in South Africa, Uganda, and Ghana. Here are Dr. King's disclosures. This educational activity is supported by an independent educational grant from Gilead Sciences Incorporated. However, all activity content and materials have been developed solely by the planning committee members and faculty presenters. The learning objectives for the program are, describe barriers that prevent HIV screening and pre-exposure prophylaxis uptake by black men who have sex with men and strategies to overcome these barriers. Describe monitoring recommendations for PrEP. Assess the benefits and limitations of new and in-development PrEP. Describe the benefits of rapid initiation of antiretroviral therapy. Thank you. I'll now turn the presentation over to Dr. King. Thank you, Tabitha. Thank you for that great introduction. And I want to welcome everybody to what will be an exciting discussion. Today's focus will be looking upon the issues of HIV pre prevention and treatment within black and brown communities. As you know, we're seeing large discrepancies with regards to access to care and treatment prevention. So I wanna open up our discussion with a case. Now, David is a 34 year old cisgender black man. He has a primary cisgender female partner, reports that he uses condoms with her to prevent pregnancy. David also has sex with cisgender men but he's hesitant to talk with his healthcare provider about his experiences with men because he does not identify as gay. David says that he has sex with men about once a month and tries to use condoms most of the time for anal sex. David is concerned that taking PrEP without him as having sex with men and thinks that he's using condoms anyways for his highest risk sexual activity. So I want you to think about David in the context of this discussion we're having, and we will revisit David a little bit later in our presentation. Let's look at HIV epidemiology in the United States in 2019. There are approximately 380 million individuals in the United States, and 1.2 million people in the United States are living with HIV. 13% of those are, overall are unaware of their diagnosis. Of those, 235,000 are Black African-American men who have sex with men. And of these individuals, 17% are unaware of their diagnosis. Now, there are 38,000 new cases annually of HIV. 25% of them in 2019 were among Black African-American MSMs, and 21% in 2019 were among Latinx. Now, Latinx is a way of being gender neutral. We're describing Latinos and Latinas. This is a very important slide. This is the rate of new HIV diagnoses stratified by race and ethnicity in 2019. And you can look at the bar graphs here, you can see outlined in the red is African-Americans, in the off pink is Hispanic and Latinx, and the second to the last column is whites. And what the takeaway about this is for the rate per 100,000, black individuals are eight times higher rates of new diagnoses compared to white individuals, 
and Latinx individuals are four times more likely to be diagnosed with HIV as compared to their white counterparts. This is also a very important slide. The CDC did an analysis looking upon diagnoses, and they found that the lifetime risk of HIV among MSM differed greatly by race and ethnicity. In terms of white MSMs, it was 9%. Hispanic MSMs was 25%. That means one out of four uh, Latinx uh, MSMs had a lifetime risk of acquiring HIV. But in Black MSMs, the numbers were much, much higher. A lifetime risk of 50%, or one out of two Black MSMs were, had a lifetime risk of HIV. Now, we know this is not biological. We know this is also a proxy for socioeconomics and social determinants of health, which we'll discuss later on in the presentation. Okay, so let's focus on Los Angeles County. Now we realize a lot of you attending this presentation are not from LA County, but we wanted to focus on LA County because we're doing one of the initiatives here. In LA County, black males account for 4% of the LA County population, but 16.4% of people living with HIV. Latinx males account for 24% of the population in LA County, but 40% of people living with HIV. Most new cases of HIV, 81%, are acquired versus male-to-male -male sexual transmission, compared with 66% nationally. Also in LA County, in terms of knowledge of HIV status, when you compare white MSMs, Latinx MSMs, and Black MSMs, they're the least likely of all MSMs to know that they have HIV. What can we do about this? Well, let's start the change of barber educations. We're partnering with barbers in Los Angeles, and we'll be doing this nationally as well. But we're focusing on barbers that serve the Black community, to raise awareness of HIV treatment and prevention. The barbershop has been a long and staple in the black community. If you wanna know what's happening in the black community, go to the barbershops, they have the pulse of the community. It's a safe space to discuss a range of topics, including politics, current events, cultural preservation, preservations, and healthcare. A study in heart disease awareness in the black community provided barbers with resources to spread the message to their clients. But barbers have not been united with providers only solely with heart disease. There's been hypertension, prostate cancer awareness, and also with HIV treatment and screening. So there's a wide precedence with regards to utilizing barbers and providers in order to improve healthcare in the, in the United States, particularly focusing on the black community. We need your help. Currently we're presenting education to barbers so they can learn more about HIV treatment and prevention. Three weeks ago, the three of us here pictured, we were educated barbers at Barbican in LA, which is a big convention with regards to barbers. And we'll continue to educate with face-to-face -face visits with LA area barbers. We discuss the importance of HIV prevention and treatment, and how barbers can talk about such sensitive issues to their clients. And we encourage barbers to participate in our referral network program. Barbers who participate will receive a list of healthcare providers in the neighborhood who screen patients for HIV and prescribe PrEP or ART. The importance of this talk too is not only to give you the education, but to tell you more about this, this program, because you can be part of that network, the referral network. And we're gonna learn more about that later on in the presentation. This slide is, is diagnosis by transmission category in the United States. And we see overall that the male-to-male -male sexual contact is the highest transmission category of 66%. Heterosexual contact is female, the is 16%. Heterosexual contact with male is 8%. We're overwhelmingly the transmission category is sexual contact. This slide is also increasingly important because we're seeing a large number of HIV incidents within the younger population. This is a diagnosis about Black MSNs by age in the United States in 2019. And we see overwhelmingly from 13 to 24 and 25 to 34, the highest numbers of HIV diagnoses among this younger population. However, let's not forget that we're also seeing it in 45 to 54 and 55 and up in terms of age groups. So this is a very important slide to me. This is the HIV care continuum stratified by race or what we call also the cascade of care. We see though overwhelmingly we're doing very well in terms of knowledge of status as represented by the red bar graphs. African-Americans in the left-hand side, Latinx in the middle and whites in the right-hand side and all of them have high rates of knowledge of their status. However, we're starting to see a drop off of care with regards to being linked to care. That means that they have access and identified a provider and have been going to that provider. Whereas in the white community, we see 83% and the Latinx community, we see 84%.
we see only 70% of African Americans are having been linked to care. The next bar graph over is also worrisome as well too. This is where we see the drop off of care, of viral suppression. That means that somebody has been taking their medications, has been in care, and the virus is suppressed. We only see 61% of African Americans have viral suppression compared to 65% in Latinx and 71% in terms of whites. And we'll see the importance of viral suppression later on in our, in our communication. So what are the barriers to equity? Arguably, I think the three points in the left column are crucial and actually lead and are highly correlated with the problems that we see on the right-hand side. The stigma associated with PrEP, either by taking PrEP as being seen as being promiscuous or not wanting to take PrEP because they feel it's a gay-associated or an MSM-associated drug. HIV stigma is still highly correlated with regards to seeking care or and or not being receiving care. Racism, we can't argue that the systemic racism involves the social determinants of health and it can pack access to care and both internalized and external homophobia can also prevent individuals from seeking quality care. But what does that mean? And how does that parlay into this various inequity of care? Well, if you are not trusting the healthcare system because things that you've actually experienced yourself or that your parents or your family members have experienced, you're not gonna trust a system that you don't feel comfortable in going to. If you don't go to the healthcare system, then you're not gonna be able to know your status because you're not gonna be tested. If you're not gonna be tested and treated, then there leads to higher rates of STIs as well too. Also, we know that there's lower access to care, healthcare because of situations of socioeconomic status. And finally, we know that also trauma leads to poor access to care and higher risk taking behavior that could lead to being coming HIV positive. Okay, so within this slide, we're talking about the structural barriers to care and prevention for Black MSMs. And we see within the Venn diagram, we see racism, homophobia, and HIV stigma, how all of these can negatively impact access to care and prevention for Black MSMs. Feelings of anxiety, defensiveness, and low self-worth can impact access to care. Sigma within one's own community, broader society, and a largely white gay male community can also impact whether someone decides to access care as well. Finally, we will see some of the structural barriers such as poverty, unemployment, housing, and racial segregation can directly impact the quality of one's care or whether one actually accesses that care at all. What does this parlay into? It parlays into black adults less likely to have a usual source of health care. Black people, Black men in particular are less likely than white people to have a usual source of health care other than the emergency room. Black men in particular have less frequent health care contacting for preventive care compared to Black women. And we see there's a wide vari variation in accessibility to primary care among different neighborhoods. For example, in Philadelphia, areas with African American residents uh, greater than 80% are 20 times more likely to have the lowest access to primary care. So, how do we do this? How do we find out someone's zero status, which is the basis of where we're gonna go next. And this is how we do this by screening for HIV. This is called the status neutral care continuum. The first basis is to do the HIV test. On the left, if, they, if the person is found to be negative with the result of an HIV test, and they are a proper candidate for PrEP, which we will talk about a little bit later as a prevention method for HIV, we keep them through constant um, contact with the healthcare provider with continued participation. And by taking PrEP, reduce the risk of HIV. And as you see here, we do repeat testing to make sure to ensure the individual is HIV negative. If the individual is found to be HIV positive or living with HIV, we put them also into immediate treatment. Again, important to retain that individual within care. By being in care, we can, on our medications, we can suppress that virus therefore improving the health of that individual and also improving the health of the community. And then we know that ongoing maintenance and support are the same whether a person is HIV positive, living with HIV, or has a negative HIV test result. The first thing is to know the serial status, and that's by HIV testing. The importance of testing is that we want to get individuals early within the course of their disease. Many people with HIV are identified at later stages of the disease, and this is what we see a lot in African-Americans Latinx. Individuals unaware that they have HIV account for 40% of new sexual transmissions of HIV. 
People do not know they're HIV positive, they can unwillingly pass it on to another individual. 13% of people living with HIV in the United States do not know their status, as we talked about earlier. This is particularly true when we're looking at the young population, ages 13 to 24, where 45% of, of those individuals with HIV do not know their status. We also know that risk behaviors change when people find out whether they're HIV positive or not, or their serostatus. Earlier testing can lead to earlier diagnosis and earlier linkage to care and get people on medications quickly. And there's survival benefit for that individual. We are preserving their immune system. We are cutting down inflammation. We're cutting down all this sequelae that can happen once HIV starts taking over. And but more importantly too, is also a transmission blocking stuff for the community. If individuals who are living with HIV or taking their medications and they, we can suppress their virus. And if that virus suppression is, is sustainable, then we know that there's absolutely no way they can pass on the virus sexually to any of their partners. U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable. Okay, so guidelines for HIV testing. How do we test individuals with HIV? The problem with doing testing based solely upon risk is that we miss about 20% of persons with HIV our externalized behaviors and beliefs about a person that was, who was at risk for HIV, if we just go solely on that, we're gonna miss about 20% of the individuals. This is why the Grady recommendations for screening adolescents and adults ages 15 to 65 should be testing as part of the annual examination. And younger and older people at increased, increased risk for HIV should also be screened as well. Pre-screening is reasonable for people at increased risk of HIV. These are sexually active MSMs or non-monogamous relationships, persons with sexual partners living with HIV, people with behaviors that increase the risk of HIV. The example is condomless intercourse, having other STIs, injection drug use, transactional sex, sex partners with unknown HIV status, and anybody who requests a test should be screened for HIV. Okay. And this is the problem that we're seeing. There is inadequate HIV screening for Black MSMs. A recent meta-analysis published in JADES in 2019 at 42,000 Black MSNs from 67 studies combined shows that while 88.2% had an HIV test at some point in their lives, only 42% are tested frequently and only 63% were tested in the last six months. Now, this is contrary to the recommendations that MSN be screened at frequent intervals every three to six months. Again, on the right side, we see again locally here in LA County, uh, black MSMs with HIV are least likely of all MSMs to know that they have HIV. So how do we screen for HIV? Laboratory-based standard testing, fourth generation HIV tests that includes the P24 antigen and antibody test. We use this as routine screening and you can incorporate it as part of your annual exam. You have to bring the patient back for results a follow up or call within seven days, and this is reportable to the Department of Public Health. Now, there are other tests that you'll see uh, HIV rapid tests, like the Aura Quick tests or finger sticks, and they have several advantages. You can get the results within minutes, increase access to prevention and intervention, and there's minimal or no equipment skill required. A lot of these are CLIA wave tests, they can be done at testing units, you know, at bars, at uh, healthcare events, etc. The problem is that HIV rapid tests may miss recent or acute infections. If positive with a rapid test, you have to do a confirmatory test. So they have to go to the lab. If acute infection is suspected, then you should check a viral load. Again, that's a laboratory test as well. So the HIV rapid tests have several advantages. You can get the results quickly. They can be done outside the clinical setting. However, there are some caveats that we have to watch with that. So let's talk about pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. Let's get back to David. So David is a 34 year old cisgender black male. Remember he has a primary cisgender female partner that he uses condoms with in order to prevent pregnancy. He also has sex with uh, cisgender men and he's concerned that PrEP will out him as having sex with men and thinks that he uses condoms for his highest risk sexual activity. So clearly this is a situation where David needs to talk with his provider more about PrEP and it might just not happen in that that initial healthcare setting. This is something that David needs more education about PrEP. So when should PrEP be considered? Well, the request for PrEP without need for individuals to disclose specific risk, meaning that the individual does not have to tell you 
what type of sexual behaviors that they may have in order to, in order to receive PrEP. However, these are some of the times you should be thinking as a provider, this is an individual that might be a candidate for PrEP. Anyone that comes into your office with an STI diagnosis or a request for testing for STIs, this is somebody you should think about for PrEP. Can, if they report inconsistent or infrequent condom use, this is someone that had a recent MPEP usage, meaning that they were exposed to HIV and have, were taken MPEP. This is somebody that can be transitioned easily onto PrEP. Request for HIV testing. They have a partner who has an HIV infection and they don't know if that partner is taking the medication or not. This is someone who has multiple partners or concerns that their partners are non-monogamous as well. Sexual activity in high prevalence areas or networks. Transitional sex from money, drugs, rent. Use of drugs or alcohol, especially in relation to sexual activity or chem sex. Use of IV drugs and a history of incarceration of the individual, your patient, or the individual's partner. How effective is PrEP? PrEP is very effective. It can reduce the risk of HIV acquisition from sex by 99% when taken as prescribed. PrEP also reduces the risk of HIV among people who inject drugs by at least 74% when taken as prescribed. However, PrEP only protects against HIV. It does not protect against acquiring other STIs. PrEP is very effective, but again, we're seeing racial inequities with regards to access to PrEP and utilizing PrEP. White individuals accounted for 25% of new HIV diagnoses, but 70% of PrEP users compared to Blacks or African-Americans, which are 42% of new diagnoses, only 14% of PrEP users, and Latinx, 28% of new diagnoses, but only 16% of PrEP users. Clearly, there's a big racial discrepancy with regards to utilization of PrEP. Further, 60% of white individuals with an indication from PrEP received a prescription for PrEP compared to African-Americans 8% and Latinx 14%. So who is eligible for PrEP? Well, to be eligible for PrEP, the primary thing is that they have to have a negative HIV test. There also can't be any signs or symptoms of acute HIV fever, sore throat, adenopathy, rash, or headache. No contraindicated medications. We have to know their hepatitis B status. The reason why we have to know their hepatitis B status is if they have active or chronic H HPV. If they're on PrEP and they stop PrEP, it can cause an HPV flare because the tenofovir in PrEP suppresses the virus. But hepatitis B itself is not a contraindication for PrEP. Also, we have to check their renal function, their creatinine clearance. They have to have greater than 60 milliliters per minute for TDF FTC or greater than 30 milliliters per minute for TAF FTC. Now, who is not eligible for PrEP? Well, these are patients already living with HIV. The reason being that PrEP itself is not a complete HIV treatment regimen and we could be causing damage to our patients. Your HIV status must be confirmed whether it's positive or negative. Patients at a high risk for acute retroviral syndrome. Again, when we talked about screening, sometimes screenings might miss things, particularly in outdoor settings. We want to check an HIV RNA PCR, which is a viral load, just to make sure. And finally, who are also are not eligible for PrEP, patients who have a lowered kidney function or renal insufficiency, and that's having less than 60 uh, for TDF FTC or less than 30 for TAF FTC. So testing people using oral PrEP, this is the bread and butter of how we're going to manage our patients on PrEP. And as you see at the top columns is the timeline, screening at baseline every three months, every six months and every year. The crucial thing is making sure that our patients are HIV negative. So we have to screen them with an HIV test, preferably a fourth generation at baseline and also every three months. We also need to know their creatinine clearance, right? Their renal function. So we have to screen them at baseline and also every six months if they're over the age of 50 or if their renal function creatinine clearance is less than 90 when we start PrEP. And every year, if they're less than the age of 50, and if their creatinine clearance is greater than 90 at PrEP initiation. We should also screen them at 
baseline and every three months and every six months for some of the STDs. Syphilis, syphilis is increasing in this country. We wanna screen them at baseline. And with MSMs and uh, transgender women, we wanna screen for syphilis every three months. For all others individuals, everybody we wanna screen them every six months. So baseline every six months for syphilis. We see the same thing for gonorrhea and chlamydia. We also wanna make sure that we encourage our, yourselves, your providers, to screen, not just with blood and urine, but also do three-site testing. Swab the pharyngeal area and also swab the anal area as well too. Hepatitis B, for the reason we mentioned earlier as well, we need to know whether our individuals have chronic Hep B or not. Hepatitis C, we wanna screen our MSMs and persons who are in drug drugs at baseline. We also wanna do an annual screening as well. And finally, we wanna make sure about pregnancy. And for persons with childbearing potential, we wanna screen them at baseline. And we also wanna screen them every three months for pregnancy. What are the medications for PrEP? Well, the two medications that are FDA approved currently are Trovada, which is tenofovir dysproxyl fumarate and cytobine, or TDF-FTC, and Descovy, which is tenofovir elafinamide and intracytobine, or TAF-FTC. Let's talk about Trovada first, which is on the left. It was approved for PrEP in 2012, but we've been using Trovada for HIV treatment for years prior to that. Is approved for individuals who have a creatinine clearance of greater than 60. There is a small risk of kidney or bone toxicity. So we have to measure again the kidney function and see if there are changes. And depending upon your standard of care, you, if you wanted to do a, a baseline DEXA scan as well, too. Although we prescribe it for daily PrEP, and that's FDA approved, is being studied for 211 or on demand use in MSM and transgender women. 211 means if you know that you're going to have a hookup on Friday, you take two of the Travada pills on Thursday, one the day of on Friday, and one pill afterwards as well. But what is FDA approved, the standard right now is taking PrEP daily. It's approved for all that risk populations. So it's approved for both, it's for both cisgender and transgender men and cisgender and transgender women. And currently there's a generic uh, formulation of TDF FTC available. On the right-hand side, we're going to Descovy, which is TAF-FTC. Now, it was just recently approved for PrEP, although, again, this is a medication we've been using widely for, for HIV care for some time. Um, it is approved for individuals who have a lower uh, renal function, creatinine clearance less than 30, greater than 30, excuse me. But here are the key things that you need to realize. And again, you'll be seeing this later in your tests. There's fewer bone and renal toxicities with Descovy as compared to to Travada. We see a small increase in LDL, which is the low density lipoprotein, and a small increase in terms of weight when individuals of for Descovy as compared to Travada. Travada is considered weight neutral. It is not indicated for prevention of HIV from vaginal sex. So again, it's not because it's not effective in women or in, or in uh, cisgender women, um, because again, we use Descovy for HIV treatment. It's just that it's not been studied as of yet and we haven't had the data yet as yet of whether PrEP by Descovy is effective in cisgender women, but that's currently being studied. Another benefit for Descovy versus Travada, it's the much smaller pill size. So what are the barriers to PrEP? We see that there are both patient level barriers, provider level barriers, and structural barriers as well. Under patient level barriers, one of the primary things are lack of PrEP awareness, both at the patient side and also on the provider side. There's a low procession of risk in terms of the patients. They don't perceive themselves as being a risk for HIV and they don't know about the medication. So why should they take it? Medical mistrust comes in so important with regards to, do you trust your provider and the information being provided to you? Can you go to a provider that you feel comfortable enough to express your desire to be on PrEP? The stigma of being attached to being on PrEP as well, being seen as a gay medication, a gay drug, being seen as a drug for, for, to promote promiscuity as well. All that stigma was attached and, and it was a barrier for individuals to get PrEP. And perceptions of side effects, real and, real and imagined as well. There's provider level barriers. Again, a lot of providers are not aware about that PrEP exists or how to prescribe PrEP. The reluctance to prescribe because you're prescribing a medication you may not be familiar with. The stigma 
attached to the uh, to PrEP as well. And this is probably more likely to be external stigma about who should be on PrEP and who should not be on PrEP. And the purview paradox, not my job. The patient wants PrEP. The primary care provider thinks this is something that should be in the IDs or an infectious disease purview. The ID doc feels that this is something that should be in the primary care purview. My two cents, this is a preventive measure that can be done at the level of the primary care doctor. It's very easy to do this. Structural barriers, incarceration, racism again impacting access to care and social determinants of health, manifesting itself in lack of insurance, poverty, uh, and also homophobia. So how do we overcome these barriers to prep uptake? We have to have good communication and coordination between patients and client care coordinations to social works. We need to facilitate linkage to social services and peer support. We need to frame PrEP as not just about HIV, but this is a preventive measure. This is gets individuals into doctor's offices where we can do other things like manage hypertension, diabetes, lipids, et cetera. So it's a holistic approach to care. This is prevention. Okay, this can decrease stigma this way. Considering alternative PrEP provision strategies, not everybody that wants to be on PrEP wants to go to the doctor's office. So doing it by telemedicine. We did a lot of telemedicine during COVID as well to provide PrEP. You can still interact with the patient, you can perform and order labs, and they can get pharmacies to deliver the PrEP medication to the, to the client. Some states are now have passed laws where the pharmacies themselves are dispensing PrEP. So these are other alternative strategies for people to get onto PrEP, but not necessarily going to the doctor's office where they feel either they may not be welcome or they feel that they don't want to be identified. Looking at your campaigns, you know, make sure that they're game-based, stigma-reducing campaigns, increasing capacity for reimbursement for PrEP medications and services through policy change, Medicaid expansions. We see that there was less PrEP in states that did not have Medicaid expansion. And streamlining clinical procedures within your offices to allow for same-day PrEP starts for patients who do not have obvious medical contraindications. If somebody wants to be on PrEP and they don't have any medical contraindications, we should get that medication to them as quickly as possible. And that's where the same-day PrEP will come into effect. How patients can pay for PrEP. When we did Barbicon, two people came up to me and said, well, how do you pay for it? Well, most insurance plans and state Medicaid programs cover PrEP. There may be some prior authorizations that we have to do within our clinics, but most insurance plans and state Medicaid or federal programs also as well cover PrEP. There's a Ready Set PrEP program that provides PrEP to people with no medication insurance. There's the information there. There's copay assistance offered by the manufacturer Gilead through the Advancing Access Program. And some states, California as well, have their own PrEP assistant programs I can cover medication, clinical visits, and lab costs. So this is called PrEP app, where they are the provider of last resort. And this, again, you'll see on the blue, you'll see the websites and contact information for these programs. But clearly, there should not be an insurance barrier or a payer barrier for covering PrEP, because it's covered through all these programs. So let's get back to David. So David comes back to the clinic one year later and reports that he is now interested in starting PrEP. In further communication with David, he explains that he had a few concerning encounters, a broken condom. He also had an SCI that was diagnosed elsewhere. So we screened David for PrEP, including knowing his status. His fourth generation test comes back non-reactive and David starts PrEP. Now, there's a couple things out here that we need to focus upon. One, that David had an STI that was diagnosed someplace else. So he went someplace else for care. And two, David is also very lucky is that his test came back non-reactive. So what would we do if David's test did not come back non-reactive, but tested positive for HIV? So now let's talk about HIV treatment. So what are the goals of treatment for individuals living with HIV? Primary, we want to achieve viral suppression. If we achieve viral suppression, we restore and we preserve the immune function of that individual. We reduce HIV-associated morbidity, and we prolong the duration and quality of survival. Individuals are living fruitful lives. They are able to work, they're able to go to school, they're able to have children, and their life expectancy is, is equivalent to those of individuals who are not HIV positive. 
We also can protect individuals, their partners as well, by being undetectable, which equals untransmittable, the U equals U. If they're on their medications, then we prevent HIV transmission through sexual contact. So how do we do this and why do we do this? The first day, if possible, that somebody is tested positive through, we want to start them on medications, okay? Some people who are not engaged in care between initial diagnosis and time ART is prescribed. Again, that's that discrepancy that we saw with the cascade of care where somebody knows their status, but then there is a time period where there's a drop off between where they are linked to care. We wanna start them on PrEP immediately. Rapid ART initiation increases medication uptake, increases the engagement in care, but because again, we're not focusing care just on HIV, but there are a constellation of other things we wanna take care of, and accelerates time to viral suppression. This is important as well too. If you are doing the annual screenings, you may encounter an individual, one of your patients who is HIV positive. If you're not comfortable managing an HIV, please start the treatment and provide a warm handoff to an experienced HIV provider. And this could be an infectious disease doctor or certified HIV specialist. So we wanna start individuals on medications quickly. We wanna do a rapid start, right? And these are the guidelines as recommended by the DHHS. Single type of regimens, big TARV. You see that it's in the outline of the red box, so that's gonna come up as an answer. Big TARV is the brand name. The medications are big Tegravir, which is the integrase inhibitor, TAF and imtricitabine, or we would know that as Discovy, but it's all in one tablet. Simtuza. Darunavir, which is a protease inhibitor with colbicistat, which is a boosting agent, plus TAF and intracytabine. Again, that's the SCOBY, but it's all included in one tablet. So those are the single tablet regimens. The multi-tablet regimens are Darunavir, which is boosted with colbicistat, plus either TAF or tenofovir, uh, plus intracytabine or lamivudine. Another regimen is dolotegravir, which is an integrase inhibitor, like pitegravir, plus TAF or TDF, plus intracytabine or mobility as well. Now, the caveats, again, we have to look at the renal function. TAF should not be used in patients with creatinine clearance less than 30. TDF or tenofovir should not be used in patients with creatinine clearance less than 60. And beware of potential drug-to-drug -drug interactions because your patients may be on other medications other than their HIV medications. We also want to be aware of, of specific conditions. So the comorbid conditions as well. Remember, some of our patients are older. So there's risk and they may already have cardiovascular disease, hyperlipidemia, renal disease, osteoporosis. Also realizing that untreated HIV or HIV itself can also lead to renal disease and inflammation can also cause hyperlipidemia as well too, which can cause cardiovascular disease. Pregnancy or potential to become pregnant. We may have to alter our regimens if an individual is pregnant or is, um, has the potential to become pregnant. Co-infections of hepatitis B, which we talked about, hepatitis C or tuberculosis. We may have to alter our regimens either to treat TB or, to, or our HIV regimens because some of the medications that are standard for, for TB have a drug-to-drug -drug interaction with HIV medications. So what is the baseline testing that we have to do for our warm handoffs to infectious disease doctors or HIV providers, or for just your standard of care for if you're gonna take care of your patients who are HIV positive or living, or living with HIV. The first we wanna make sure is their HIV one and two fourth generation tests. We wanna measure their CD4 count, which is the measure of their immune system. We wanna measure the HIV viral load or by using a PCR RNA test. We wanna get baseline chemistry panels as well the CMP, the CBC, LFTs, viewing creatinine, urinalysis, pregnancy testing for those individuals who have the potential to become pregnant, hepatitis A, B, and C, because we, if they are hepatitis B or C active, we wanna treat that and monitor that, fasting blood glucose levels and a lipid panel. If you're considering using a back of your as part of your regimens for ART, you first wanna screen individuals for HLAB 5701 to make sure that there is not a hypersensitivity uh, to abacavir and resulting in possible Stevens-Johnson, which is life-threatening. So this is one of the reasons why we don't use abacavir regimens for rapid start, because we need to find out first if they're HLA-B5701 positive. 
we want to do a genotypic resistance testing to see if there are any archive mutations that this individual may have inherited. And with that, that might change your regimen that you want to put somebody on. You want to do three site STI testing. You're testing again for the gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis as well. So three site testing is oral swabs, urine swabs if, if appropriate, vaginal swabs, and anal swabs if appropriate. So in addition, we can determine the risk of opportunistic infections like TB and the need for prophylaxis. Great, so that concludes my component. So I'm gonna bring us back to Tabitha, who will talk to you about an exciting proposal we have regarding our collaboration between barbers and providers. Thank you, Dr. King. That was a great presentation. As Dr. King mentioned, we're developing a network of clinicians to be involved in our fade out program. If you're in the Los Angeles metro area, please join this important effort. You can be part of a referral list where barbershop clients are referred to your office to be confidentially tested for HIV. When you sign up, we'll contact you directly and explain the simple process of what to do when a fade out program patient visits your clinic. Each clinic that participates will receive a unique QR code. All your office staff has to do is show this code to the patient, have them scan it, and they'll receive a $20 coupon for a future haircut. To sign up, simply email me, Tabitha Washington, at twashington at dkbmed.com, or you can scan the QR code on your screen now. If you're outside of Los Angeles, you can still participate just reach out to us and we'll tell you how. I'll now turn it over to Dr. King for his key takeaways. Great, thank you, Tabitha. So thank you everybody for participating. Our take home points, Black and Latinx MSM are disproportionately affected by HIV and are under prescribed PrEP to prevent HIV. Racism, homophobia, and stigma among the barriers that contribute to the overrepresentation of Black men among people living with HIV and the underprescribing of PrEP. PrEP is an effective method of preventing HIV. People using PrEP must be monitored for STIs, including HIV. Testing for HIV every three months is recommended in CDC guidelines. PrEP is currently available in two daily oral fixed dose combination tablets, Trivana, which is TDF, and Tricitabine and Descovy or TAF and Tricitabine. For people with HIV, antiretroviral treatment should be initiated as soon as possible after, di after diagnosis. Bictarvi, Bictegravir, TAF and Tricitabine is a single tablet regimen that can be initiated before results of drug resistance, HLEB 5701 and viral load testing are available. Again, notice that's blocked off and so that will be coming up a little bit later. Okay, and we've got some questions in the Q&A and some people sent directly to me. So I'll read the first one out. Uh, Dr. King, are there new options for treatment and PrEP besides pills? Yes, and thank you very much for asking that question, Dr. Butler. There are new treatments. In fact, we're really excited about some of the possibilities of some of the injectables being utilized. As you guys are probably aware, we're doing injectables for, for HIV treatment. Uh, Cabotegravir, which is in Cabanuva, is being looked upon for um, and possibly will be FDA approved next year as a treatment option for PrEP. So instead of doing the oral PrEP, which are the tablets that we just talked about, Trivada and uh, Discovy, this will be uh, an injection that eventually will be every two months. So imagine that we don't have to necessarily have individuals take tablets every day. We don't have to have individuals have to worry about, well, where am I in relationship to having a hookup or not? An injection every two months. Another, another injectable that's being studied is the capsid inhibitor that's being, it's being a molecule that's been originally sort of formed JSK, but is now being looked upon in terms of Gilead as well. And that's a study that's happening right now. That's going to be, instead of a, an intramuscular injection like Cabotegravir, it's going to be a sub-Q injection, and that's a possibility in every six months. Also, Merck has a molecule called Isladivir that's a possibly being looked upon for PrEP as an, in, as a, an implant, kind of like Norplant, kind of like the birth control used to be. So there's going to be amazing opportunities for individuals who are very adverse to taking medications 
uh, daily medications, who may have problems taking oral tablets, um, lots of opportunities so that that's going to be available for freedom for individuals to be protected and against HIV. So I can't wait for some of these things to occur. Also for women, and one of the things we, we are not looking upon and we should be more focused upon as well is that cisgender women are also directly impacted by HIV as you saw on our slides. And so not only I think will the injectables be great for some cisgender women, but also the possibility of some of the vaginal inserts as well. Okay, thanks Dr. King. Another question, can a two drug regimen be used in rapid start? No, not as of yet, although there are studies that are coming out, it's, they are not, it's not FDA recommended to use a two drug regimen for rapid start. Now there is a stat study that's coming out for the product and the brand name is Dovato, which is Deltegravir and, 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 an, and, and, excuse me, and a nuke. And that is being looked upon for whether to do rapid start or not. But as of now, it's not recommended for a two drug regimen. Okay. And another question, what do you think is the future for a long-term prep? I think that the future looks very bright. I am very excited about these possibilities. I think the major thing that's gonna to have to happen is to figure out ways to do the work in our clinics, right? Um, but you can imagine individuals who are young, young individuals or individuals who are working as well, they come in, they get their injection and they leave. You know, and if it's the possibility of doing an injection every two months or possible of having an implant that's in their arm for, for six months or more, I mean, it's amazing freedom. I think that could be happening for individuals. So I think it's gonna be very exciting to find what's gonna happen. The problem I think the backlash is gonna be not only is to, for us as providers to be able to talk to our patients about this and to let individuals know about this. Oftentimes I think communities of color and communities that are impoverished are the last to get these new developments. But we also have to overcome this issue of mistrust about these new elements as well too. That's why I think it's very important for us African-American providers, Latino providers, providers that take care of these, these populations to make sure that we're well-versed in it. So we can be able to talk to our patients about that. This would be an exciting thing also to have our community partners as barbershops to be able to talk about this as well too. So I think there's gonna be some exciting things gonna be happening down the pipe. Dr. King, do I need written consent from the patient to test for HIV? Okay, you do not need written consent. I mean, if patients have the option to, uh, tr to opt out of testing. Testing is a grade A recommendation and it should be included as part of your annual physical or any time a patient wants to be tested. Um, what, I should, what I would recommend to do though, and what I do as a provider, is I tell my patients everything I'm testing. So there's open, there's openness, there is uh, trans, uh, transparency. So the patients know what I'm testing for and they have the option to say, hey, look, I don't wanna be tested for this as well. And I ask them, why, why, why or why not? But I don't try to force tests on individuals. But as I said, one of the bases for us is to make sure everybody knows their, their status. My base and knowing their status, we can decide which, how to treat patients. If they're HIV positive, they get to my medications quickly. If they're HIV negative and they want to be on a medication to protect them against becoming HIV positive, if appropriate, then they can be on medications, but they have to be tested. Okay. How do I talk with a patient who is not ready to start PrEP or HIV treatment? Great question. I get that a lot as well. One of the things I have in my office, I'm a primary care provider, but also an HIV specialist. Uh, so I have posters, I have information, I have, you know, um, models of PrEP as well too in my office. And so it's a great conversation starter. And we also have to be sensitive to the issues that some patients are not ready for this as well too. Sometimes people come in and right away because I'm listening to some of the programs, they say, hey, I want to start PrEP. For the patients who are interested, but I'm not sure about it, it takes time. And it's that building of trust. One of the things too that I think is very important is just because somebody is identifies as MSM or they may not necessarily have to be on PrEP, right? They could be in a, in a, mon a monogamous relationship. Another thing that I also respect after talking to groups of African-American MSMs as well, 
if you're there to talk to the doctor about diabetes, hypertension, all these other things, you may not want to hear the doctor trying to force or feel that the doctor's trying to force prep on you. So again, being very conscious about what your patients want, being flexible in terms of what your patients want, and being able to provide that information. And also to be ready once it happens. Because somebody is ready to, for, to start on prep and you're not aware about it, you don't know how to prescribe it, you don't know about the payer programs that are available to them, you might lose that patient. Okay. Dr. King, our last question, how long does it take to achieve an undetectable viral load with current HIV medications? Yeah, I mean, the current HIV medications are amazing with regards to like how they are effective in terms of reducing viral loads. I mean, I've seen people with very high viral loads um, being dropped to uh, be undetectable, meaning we cannot detect it by the standard testing within two to two months, two weeks to a month. Thank you again. Um, I did see one more question about participating in the referral network. You can email me at twashington at DKB, <clears throat> excuse me, twashington at dkbmed.com to get more information. Uh, this is, it's not just limited to those that are in the Los Angeles area. If you're outside of the Los Angeles area, please feel free to send an email and we can give you uh, some information on how you can be part of it. And again, thank you again, Rachel and Dr. King. Dr. King, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. King. And to all our learners, thank you so much for joining us. Take care.